and 14th of Aldemir. Some assemblages still continued to take place in a section of the Pelletier on the 14th in the morning. Some columns debashed against them by the boulevards of Richelieu and the Palais Royal. Some cannon had been placed in the principal avenues. The sectionaries were promptly dislodged, and the rest of the day was employed in going over the city, visiting the chief houses of the sections, gathering in arms, and reading proclamations in the evening. Order was completely restored in Paris. Once more perfectly quiet after this great event, when the officers of the Army of the Interior were presented in a body to the convention, the members by acclamation appointed Bonaparte General in Chief of this army. Berra, being no longer allowed to unite the title of representative of the people with military functions, General Manu was delivered over to a council of war. His death was required. The General in Chief saved him by telling the judges that if Manu deserved death, the three representatives who had directed operations and parlayed with sectionaries merited the same punishment that the convention ought to bring its three members to trial before it proceeded against Manu. The corporate spirit prevailed over the voices of Manu's enemies. The same commission condemned several individuals to death in contumacy, amongst others, Val Blanc. Lafon was the only person executed. This young man had evinced great courage in the action. The head of his column on the Pont Royal formed again three times under the fire of grape shot before it entirely gave way. He was an emigrant. There was no possibility of saving him. However, it might have been wished to do so. His imprudent answers constantly defeated the good intentions of his judges. The ninth, Napoleon, commander-in-chief of the Army of the Interior. After the 13th of Vendemire, Napoleon had to reorganize the National Guard, which was an object of the highest importance, and it didn't reckon no less than 104 battalions. At the same time, he formed the Guard of the Directory and reorganized that of the legislative body. These very circumstances proved eventually one of the causes of his success on the famous 18th of Brumaire. He had left such impressions on his corps that on his return from Egypt, although the directory had recommended its soldiers to pay him no military honors except when he was in full uniform, nothing could hinder them from beating to the field whenever and in whatever dress they saw him. A few months that Napoleon commanded the Army of the Interior were replete with difficulties and embarrassments. These were the installation of a new government, the members of which were divided amongst themselves and often in opposition to the councils. A silent ferment amongst the old sectionaries who composed the majority of Paris acted turbulent of the Jacobins who assembled anew under the name of the Society of the Pantheon the foreign agents of royalism who formed a powerful party the discredit of the finances and paper money which spread extreme discontent among the troops and above all the horrible famine which this period affected the capital Ten or twelve times the supply of provisions failed entirely, and the scanty daily distributions which government had been compelled to establish were interrupted. It required no ordinary degree of activity to address, to surmount so many obstacles, and to maintain tranquility in the capital despite of such a combination and calamities and difficulties. The Society of the Pantheon... Daily gave the directory new causes of uneasiness. The police durst not venture an open attack on this society. The general in chief caused the place of its meetings to be sealed up, and the members never stirred more whilst he was in the way. It was not until after the departure that they appeared again under the influence of Babouf Antonel and others, and produced the eruption of the Camp of Grinnell. Napoleon frequently had to harangue at the markets, in the streets, in the sections, and faubourgs. Here it is worthy of remark that he always found the faubourg Saint Antoine the most ready to listen to reason and the most susceptible of a generous impulse. It was during his command of Paris that Napoleon became acquainted with Madame de Beauharnais after the general disarming of the sections had been affected. A youth of 10 or 12 years of age presented himself before the staff, entreating the general in chief to give orders for restoring to him the sword of his father, who had been a general of the republic. This youth was Eugène de Beauharnais, afterwards viceroy of Italy. Napoleon, moved by the nature of his request and by his juvenile grace, granted his petition. Eugène burst into tears on beholding his father's sword. The general was touched at his sensibility and behaved so kindly to him. 
that Madame de Beaurnais thought it incumbent on her to wait on him the next day to thank him for his attention. Napoleon returned her visit without delay. Everyone knows the extraordinary grace of the Empress Josephine, her sweet and attractive manners. The acquaintance soon became intimate and tender, and it was not long before they married. 10. Napoleon appointed General-in-Chief of the Army of Italy, Scherer, who commanded the Army of Italy, was reproached as not having known how to profit by his victory of Luano. His subsequent conduct had not given great satisfaction. Many more official than military characters were seen at his headquarters at Nice. This general asked for money to pay his troops and reorganize the various branches of the service and for horses to replace those of his cavalry, which had perished for want of food. The government could give him neither the one or the other. Evasive answers were returned to his demands, and anti promises were made to amuse him. He then declared that if any farther delay took place, he should be compelled to evacuate the Genoese country, to return to the Roya, and perhaps even to repass the VAR. The directory resolved to supersede him. A young general of 25 could no longer remain at the head of the army, the interior. The public opinion of his talents and the confidence which the army of Italy had in him designated him as the only man capable of extricating it from the embarrassing situation in which it stood. The conferences which he had with the directory on this head and the projects which he submitted to its consideration left no further doubt. He set out for Nice and General General Hatri, who was 60 years of age, came from the Army of the Sambra and Musa to succeed him in the command of the Army of the Interior, which had become of less importance now that the crisis of scarcity was over and the government was firmly established. The Battle of Montenotte. One plan a campaign for entering Italy by turning the Alps. The King of Sardinia, who, from his military and geographical position, had acquired the title of Porter of the Alps had in 1796 fortresses at the openings of all the passes leading into Piedmont. If it had been wished to penetrate into Italy by forcing the Alps, it would have been necessary to gain possession of these fortresses. Now the roads do not allow the carriage of a battering train. Besides, the mountains are covered with snow during three quarters of the year, which leaves but little time for besieging these places. A plan was therefore formed for turning all the Alps and for entering Italy precisely at the moment where these high mountains terminate and where the Apennines begin. The St. Gotar is the most elevated pass of the Alps. From thence, all the others gradually decrease in height. Thus, the St. Gotar is higher than the Brenner, the latter higher than the mountains of Cador, the mountains of Cador, then the Col de Tarvis, and the mountains of Carniola. On the other side, the St. Gotar is higher than the Simplon, the Simplon higher than the St. Bernard, which is higher than Mont Sydney, and Mount Sydney higher than the Col de Tendif. From the latter point, the Alps continually decrease in height and at length terminate at the mountains of Saint Jacques, near Savona, where the Apennines begin. Then the chain of the Apennines rises again and proceeds constantly, increasing in an inverse direction, so that the Vachetta, the neighboring hills, those which separate Liguria from the states of Parma, Tuscany, and Modenese, and the Polonese keep always rising. The valley of Madonna, of Savona, and the hills of San Jacques, and Montenotte, are therefore the lowest points of the Alps and Apennines, the spot at which the former finish and the latter commence. Savona, a seaport and fortified town, was placed in such a manner as to serve both for a magazine and a point of appui. From that town of Madonna, the road is a firm, hard road, three miles long, and from Madonna to Car Cherry, it is four or five miles more. The latter space might be rendered practicable for artillery in a few days at Carcari, our carriage roads, which lead into the interior Piedmont at Montferrat. This was the only point by which Italy could be entered without passing mountains. The elevation of the ground, they're so inconsiderable. 
that at a subsequent period during the Imperial Raid, a canal was projected, which was to have connected the Adriatic with the Mediterranean by the assistance of the Po, and a branch of the Bermina, which has its source in the heights near Savona, in penetrating into Italy by the sources of the Bermuda, some hopes might be entertained of separating and intersecting the Sardinian and Austrian armies, because from that position, Lombardy and Piedmont were both menaced. It was as practicable to march on Milan as on Turin. The Piedmontese were interested in covering Turin and the Austrians in defending Milan. To the state of the two armies, the enemy's army was commanded by General Polio, a distinguished officer who had gained reputation in the campaigns of the north. This army was well provided with all it was calculated to render it formidable. The French army, on the contrary, was in want of everything, and its government was unable to supply it. The army of the Allies was composed of Austrians, Sardinians, and Neapolitans. They already amounted to... Three times the number of the French army and were to be increased successively by the forces of the Pope, by reinforcements from Naples, and by the troops of Medina and Parma. This army was divided into two grand corps, the effective army of Austria, composed of four divisions of a strong artillery and a numerous cavalry increased by a Neapolitan division forming a total of 60,000 men under arms, the effective army of Sardinia composed of three Piedmontese divisions and an Austrian division of 4,000 cavalry, commanded by the Austrian General Coley, who was himself under the command of General Beaulieu. The rest of the Sardinian forces garrisoned the fortresses or defended the passes opposite the French army, the Alps. They were commanded by the Duke of Aosta. The French army was composed of four effective divisions under Generals Messina, Augereau, La Herpe, and Souverier. Each of these divisions could, one with another, muster from six to 7,000 men under arms. The cavalry, amounting to 3,000, was in the most miserable condition, though it had been a long time on the Rhone to recruit itself, but it had wanted for provisions. The arsenals of Antibes and Nice were well furnished, but means of transport were wanting. All the draft horses had perished for what? The penury of the French finances was so great that all the efforts of the government could only furnish 2,000 louis in specie to the military chest of the army for the opening of the campaign. There was therefore nothing to be expected from France. Henceforth, no resources were to be hoped for except from victory. It was only in the plains of Italy that means a conveyance could be organized. The artillery furnished with teams, the soldiers closed, and the cavalry mounted. All this would be gained by forcing the passage of Italy the French had indeed at most but 30,000 men, whilst more than 90,000 were opposed to them. If these two armies had had to contend with each other in a general engagement, no doubt the inferiority of the French army in points of numbers, artillery, and cavalry would have ensured its easy overthrow. But as it was situated, it was enabled to supply the wanted numbers by the rapidity of its marches, the deficiency of artillery by the nature of its maneuvers, its inferiority in cavalry by the nature of its positions, the character of our troops was excellent. All the men had served in other campaigns in Italy or in those of the Pyrenees. Three. Napoleon arrives at Nice. Napoleon arrived at Nice between the 26th and 29th of March. The picture of the army which Scherer laid before him was still worse than he had been able to form any idea of. The supply of bread was very uncertain. Distributions of meat had long ceased. For means of conveyance, there were only mules and not above 200 of these could be reckoned upon. It was impossible to think of transporting above 12 pieces of cannon. The position of the army grew worse every day. Not an instant was to be lost. The army could no longer subsist where it was. It was necessary either to advance or recede. The French general gave orders to put the army in motion. He wished to surprise the enemy in the very opening of the campaign and dazzle and confound them by brilliant and decisive advantages. The headquarters had never quitted Nice since the beginning of the war. They were ordered to be transferred to Albanga. All the civilists had long considered their posts as fixed and concerned themselves much more about their own comforts than the wants of the army. The French general reviewed the troops and said to them, Soldiers, you are naked, ill-fed, much is due to us. There is nothing to pay us with. The patience and courage you have shown in the midst of these rocks are admirable. 
But they win you no glory. I come to lead you into the most fertile place in the world. Rich provinces, great cities will be in our power there. You will have wealth, honor, and glory. Soldiers of Italy, can your courage fail? Speeches like this from the young general of 25, in whom great confidence was already placed on account of the brilliant operations of Tulo, Seorgio, and Savona, directed by him in the course of the preceding wars, were received with the most lively acclamations for the purpose of turning the Alps and entering Italy by the Col de Catabona. It was necessary to assemble the whole army on its extreme right, which would have been a dangerous operation if the snow had not then covered the devouches of the Alps. The transition from the defensive to the offensive order is one of the most delicate operations in war. Surya was placed at Gretzia with his division to observe the camps which Coley had at Seva. Massena and Ogaro were placed in reserve at Lono Finale and as far as Savona. Let Art march to Menace Genoa, his vanguard commanded by Gervoni occupied Voltri. At the same instant, the general in chief caused the passage of the Bocetta and the keys of Gavi to be demanded of the Senate of Genoa, announcing thus his intention of penetrating into Lombardy and making Genoa the center of his operations. Great apprehensions prevailed in Genoa that councils placed themselves in permanence. Four. Battle of Montanotti. The 11th of April, Bolio alarmed, hastened with all possible speed from Milan to the succor of Genoa. He removed his headquarters to Novi, divided his army into three corps. The right under Coley, composed of Piedmontese, had its headquarters at Seva. It was entrusted with the defense of the Stura and Tenero, the center under the command of Dargentau marched on Montanotti to intersect the French army by falling on its left flank and cutting it at Savona in the road of the Cornici. Beaulieu in person with his left covered Genoa and marched on Voltri at the first glance. His disposition seemed skillful, but on more profound investigation of the circumstances of the country, it will be seen that Beaulieu divided his force by these means because all direct communication between his center and his left became impracticable except behind the mountains, whilst the French army, on the contrary, was placed in such a manner that it could join in a few hours and fall in a mass on either of the core of the enemy. And when one of them should be totally defeated, the other must necessarily retreat. General Darshantau, commanding the center of the enemy's army, encamped at Lower Montanotti on the 9th of April. On the 10th, he marched on Monte Ligino to debauch by Madonna. Colonel Rampon, who had been ordered to keep the three redoubts of Monte Ligino, having received intelligence of the march of the enemy, pushed forward a strong reconnoitering party to meet them. This party was driven back from noon to two o'clock when it entered the redoubts again. Darshantau attempted to carry them by an instantaneous assault. He was repulsed in three successive attacks and gave up the scheme. As his troops were fatigued, he took up a position and put off turning these redoubts in order to reduce them until the morrow. Bilyeu on his side debouched on the 9th on Genoa. On the 10th, Laarp was engaged all day with Bilyeu's vanguard before Voltri disputing the passes with him and keeping him in check. But in the evening of the 10th, he fell back in Savona and on the 11th at daybreak, he found himself with his whole division in the rear of Rampon in the redoubts of Montalagino in the same night of the 10th. The generals in chief marched with the divisions of Messina and Ogaro by the Col de Catabona and debouched behind Montanotti. At daybreak, Darshantau, surrounded on all sides, was attacked in front by Rampon and La Arme. And in rear and flank by the general in chief, Dargentau was completely routed. His whole corps was cut to pieces at the same time that Beaulieu arrived before Voltri. He now found no enemy. He did not hear the defeat at Montanate and the entrance of the French at the Piedmont till the 12th. He was then obliged to make his troops fall back and repass the bad roads into which the dispositions of his plans had thrown him. The consequence was that three days afterwards at the Battle of Milsimo, only part of his troops could come up in time. Five, Battle of Milsimo, 14th of April, on the 12th, the headquarters of the French army were at Carcheri. The defeated army had retired the Piedmontese on Milsimo and the Austrians on Dago. These two positions were connected by a Piedmontese division, which was ordered to occupy the heights of Bistro at Milsimo. 
the Piedmontese were on both sides of the road, which covers Piedmont. They were joined by Coli with all the force he had been able to bring up from the right at Dago. The Austrians occupied the position which defends Acre Road, the direct way into the Milanese. They were successfully joined by all the troops Bolio could bring back from poultry. They were in a good position for receiving all the reinforcements that might be sent to them from Lombardy. Thus, the two great debauches of Piedmont and the Milanese recovered. The enemy flattered themselves that they should have time to establish and entrench themselves there. However, advantageous the Battle of Montanotti had been for us, the enemy had found means to repair their losses through the superiority of the numbers. But the next day, but one, the 14th, the Battle at Missimo ordered us the two roads to turn in Milan. Agaro, forming the left of the French army, marched on Missimo. Messina, with the center, directed his march to Dago. And La Arp, commanding their right, took his way by the heights of Cairo. The enemy had formed an appui for their right by causing the hill of Cossaria, which commands the two branches of the Bormida to be occupied. But on the 13th, General Agaro, who had not engaged at the Battle of Montanotti, pushed the enemy's right with such impetuosity that he carried the passes of Milsimo and surrounded the hill of Caesarea. Prevera, with his rear guard, 2,000 strong, was cut off. In this desperate situation, General Prevera resolved to brave all extremities. He took refuge in an old ruined castle. And there, barricaded himself. From its top, he saw the right of the Sardinian army making dispositions for the battle of the following day, by which he hoped to be extricated. All Coley's troops from the camp Siva were expected to arrive in the course of the night. The French therefore felt it of the greatest importance to gain possession of the castle of Caesarea in the course of the day, but this post was very strong, and their attack failed. The next day, the two armies engaged. Messina and La Arp carried Dago after an obstinate conflict. Messieurs and Joubert carried the heights of Bistro. All Coley's attacks to clear Caesarea were unsuccessful. He was defeated and hotly pursued. Prevera was then compelled to lay down his arms. The enemy briskly followed up into the passes of Spigno. Left there part of his artillery with many colors of prisoners. The separation of the two armies of Austria and Sardinia was thenceforward complete. Bolio removed his headquarters to Acqui on the Milanese road and Coley returned to Siva to prevent the junction of Sururier and covered to run six. Battle of Dago, April 15th. In the meantime, a division of Austrian grenadiers who had been directed from the full tree by Sicella arrived at three in the morning at Dago. The possession was no longer occupied, but by advanced posts. These grenadiers therefore easily carried the village and created great alarm at the French headquarters where they could not comprehend how the enemy could be at Dago while we had advanced posts on the Acre Road. After two hours, hard fighting, Dago was retaken and almost the whole of the enemy's division were made prisoners. In these affairs, we lost General Bunnell at Milsimo and General de Coz at Dago. These two officers were distinguished by the most brilliant valor. They both came from the Army of the Eastern Pyrenees, and it was remarkable that the officers who came from that army of Vince most extraordinary impetuosity and courage. It was at the village of Dago that Napoleon first distinguished a chief of battalion whom he made a colonel. This was Lan, who afterwards was a marshal of the empire and duke of Montebello, and displayed talent of the first order. He will henceforth be seen to take principal part in all military events. The French general now directed his operations against Coley, and the king of Sardinia contented himself with keeping the Austrians in check. La Arp was placed in observation near Dago to secure our rear and keep Beaulieu in check, who, being greatly weakened, was now chiefly occupied in rallying and reorganizing the rack of his army. La Arp's division, being compelled to remain several days in this position, suffered greatly from the scarcity of provisions, owing to the want of means of conveyance and the wasted condition of the country. From the presence of so many troops, this circumstance produced some irregularities. Surrier, learning at Garasio, the results of the battles of Montanotti and Milsimo, put his troops in motion, occupied the height of San Giovanni, and entered Seva the same day that Ogaro arrived on the heights of Mont. 
Tsumoto on the 17th after some slight affairs. Coley evacuated the entrenched camp of Siva and retired behind the Crusaglia. The same day the general-in-chief removed his headquarters to Siva, the enemy had left there all their artillery, which they had not had time to carry off and had contented themselves of leaving a garrison in the castle. The arrival of the army on the heights of Montezumoto was a sublime spectacle. The immense and fertile plains of Piedmont lay before them. The Po, the Tenero, and a multitude of other rivers meandered in the distance. In the horizon, a white girdle of snow and ice of a stupendous height surrounded these rich valleys. This promised land, those gigantic barriers which seemed the limits of another world, which nature had delighted in rendering thus formidable, and to which art had contributed all its resources, had fallen, as if by enchantment. Hannibal forced the Alps, said the French general, surveying those mountains, but we have turned them. A happy expression which conveyed in two words the idea and the result of the campaign. The army passed the Tenero for the first time was now absolutely in the flames, and the cavalry could now be of some utility to us. General Stengel, who commanded it, passed the Crusaglia at Lisegno and at the castle Lisegno on the right of the Crusaglia, near the point at which it falls into the Tenero. 7. Action of Saint Michel, Battle of Mondavi, 20th and 22nd of April. General Severier united his forces at Saint Michel on the 20th. He passed the bridge of Saint Michel at the same time that Messina passed it to Nero to attack the Piedmontese. Both Coley, aware of the danger of his position, abandoned the confluence of the two rivers and marched in person to take up a position at Mondavi. By a fortuitous circumstance, he arrived with his forces exactly before Saint-Michel as General Sirurier was devouching from the bridge. He halted, opposed a superior force to him, and forced him to fall back. Sirurier would nevertheless have maintained himself in Saint-Michel had not one of his light infantry regiments taken to pillage. The French general debouched on the 22nd by the bridge tour and directed his march on Mondavi. Coley had already raised some redoubts there and established a position, his right at Devico and his center at Lebicoc. The same day, Surrier carried the redoubt of Lebicoc and decided the battle, which took the name of Mondovi. This town and all its magazines fell into the hands of the conqueror. General Steingel, who had advanced too far into the plain with a thousand horse, was attacked by a body of Pimentes of twice that number. He made all the dispositions that could be expected from a consummate general and was effecting his retreat towards the main body when he was mortally wounded by a pike in a charge. General Murat, at the head of the cavalry, repulsed the Piedmontes and pursued them during several hours. General Steingel, a native of Alsace, was an excellent officer of Hussars. He had served under de Maurier in the campaigns of the North and was expert, intelligent, and active. He combined the qualities of youth with those of mature age and was a true general of advanced posts. Two or three days before his death, he was the first man that entered Lesigno. The French general arrived there a few hours afterwards and found that everything had been provided and attended to. The defiles and fords had all been reconnoitered. Guides had been secured. The curate and postmaster had been examined. Communications established with several of the inhabitants. Spies dispatched in various directions. The letters at the post office ceased, and those which could furnish any military information translated and analyzed. All proper measures taken for forming magazines of provisions for the troops. Unfortunately, Steingel was nearsighted. A material effect in his profession and which contributed to his death after the Battle of Mondovi. The general-in-chief marched on Churrasco. Surrier advanced on Fasano and Ogaro on Alba the 8th, taking up Churrasco April 25th. These three columns on the 25th of April entered at the same time Churrasco, Fasano, and Alba. Coley's headquarters were Fasano on the very day that Surrier dislodged them thence. Chirasco at the junction of the Tenero and Stura was a strong place, but ill-defended and unprovided because it was not a frontier fortress. The French general considered the possession of this palace of great importance. He found some artillery in it, commenced vigorous efforts for putting it in a state of defense. The vanguard passed the Stura and advanced beyond the little town of Rock 
In the meantime, the junction of Surya had enabled us to communicate with Nice by Ponte de Nava. We received thence reinforcements of all artillery and all that could be got ready. We had taken in the different engagements, many horses and much artillery. In the plain of Mondavi, we levied horses on all sides. A few days after its entrance into Churrasco, the army had 60 guns with their stores. The cavalry was remounted. The soldiers who had no distributions during the first eight or ten days of this campaign began to receive them regularly. Pillage and disorder that constant attendance of rapid movements now ceased. Discipline was restored, and the appearance of the army improved daily amidst the abundance and resources presented by this fine country its losses were repaired the rapidity of the movements the impetuosity of the troops and above all the art of opposing them to the enemy at least upon an equality and often with advantage in point of numbers with the constant tide of success had preserved the men greatly besides soldiers arrived by all the debauches from all the depots and all the hospitals on the report of the victorious career and a budget supply of the army wines of every kind were found at piedmont those of montferrat resembled the wines of france previously to this period the misery of the french had exceeded all description the officers had for several years received only eight francs per month and the staff was wholly on foot marshal bertier preserved amongst his papers in order of the day issued at Albanga, granting to each general a gratification of three Louis the ninth. Armistice of Churrasco, April 28th. The army was now only 10 leagues from Turin. The court of Sardinia no longer knew what resolution to adopt. Its army was discouraged and partly destroyed. The Austrian army reduced to less than half. Its original number seemed to think of nothing but covering Milan. The minds of the people of Piedmont were much agitated, and the court was far from possessing the confidence of the public. It placed itself at the discretion of the French general and solicited and our mistress, to which the latter ceded. Many people would have preferred that the army should have marched and take Turin, but Turin is a fortified city. If it had been determined to close the gates against us, they could not have been forced without such a train of artillery as we did not possess. The king had still a great number of fortresses, and notwithstanding the victories which had been gained, the least check, the slightest caprice of fortune, might overturn everything. The two hostile armies, notwithstanding their numerous reverses, were still equal to the French army. They had a considerable artillery and a cavalry which had not suffered, and the French army, in spite of all its success, a degree of astonishment prevailed. The greatness of the enterprise struck everyone. The possibility of success which such slender means was a subject that doubt the least ambiguous occurrence would have been seized on by many persons disposed to exaggeration. Some officers and even generals conceived that we ought not to dare to think of conquering Italy with so little artillery, scarcely any cavalry, and so feeble an army, which disease and the distance from home would weaken every day. Some traces of these sentiments of the army may be found in the following proclamation of the general-in-chief, which he addressed his soldiers at Churrasco. Soldiers, you have in 15 days gained six, vi six victories, taken 21 stands of colors, 55 pieces of cannon and several fortresses, and conquered the richest parts of Piedmont. You have made 15,000 prisoners and killed and wounded more than 10,000 men. Here there, so you had fought for barren rocks, ennobled by your courage. But useless to the nation, your services now equal those of the conquering army of Holland and the Rhine. You were in want of everything, but you have provided everything. You have gained battles without cannon, passed rivers without bridges, made forced marches without shoes, bivouacked without brandy, and often without bread. None but Republican phalanxes, the soldiers of liberty, could have borne what you have endured. For this you have thanks to your country. It gratefully acknowledges itself partly indebted to you for its prosperity. And if, when you took too long, you gave an omen of the brilliant campaign of 1793, your present victories prognosticate one still more glorious. The two armies which lately attacked you with confidence now fly before you in consternation. Those perverse persons who laughed at your wants and rejoiced in their hearts at the anticipated triumphs of our enemies are trembling in confusion. But soldiers, it must not be concealed. You have done nothing since there remains ought to do. Neither Turin nor Milan are in your power. The ashes of the conquerors of Tarkin are still trodden underfoot by the murders of Basseville. You were in want of everything at the opening of the campaign. 
You are now abundantly provided. The magazines taken from the enemy are numerous and besieging the field artillery have arrived. Soldiers, the country is entitled to expect much from you. Will you fulfill its expectations? The greatest difficulties are no doubt surmounted, but you have still battles to fight, towns to take, rivers to cross. Are there any amongst us whose courage is enervated? Are there any who would prefer returning to the summits of the Apennines and Alps to endure patiently the insults of yon slavish soldiery? No, there are none such amongst the victors of Montenotti, Milsimo, Dago, and Moldavi. All are burning to extend the glory of the French people. All wish to humble those proud kings who dare to think of enchaining us. All are ambitious to dictate a glorious peace calculated to indemnify our country for the immense sacrifices she has made. Friends, I promise you this conquest. But there is one condition you must swear to fulfill. This is to respect the people whom you liberate. To repress the horrible acts of pillage to which the wretches excited by your enemies abandon themselves. Without this... You would not be the deliverers of nations, but scourges to them. You would not be the glory of the French people. They would disavow you, your victories, courage, your success, the blood of our brethren slain in battle. All would be thrown away if in honor and glory. As to me and the other generals in whom you confide, we should blush to command an undisciplined, unrestrained army, acknowledging no law but force. When invested with the national authority, strong justice, and the law, I shall know how to force that handful of dishonorable, cowardly, heartless men to respect the laws of humanity and honor, which they trample underfoot. I will not suffer robbers to sully your laurels. I will cause the regulation I have published in orders to be vigorously carried into effect. Pillagers shall be shot without mercy. Several have already suffered. I have had occasion to remark the readiness with which the real good soldiers have come forward to enforce the execution of the orders. People of Italy, the French army advances to break your chains. The people of France are the friends of all nations. Meet them in confidence. Your property, your religion, and your customs shall be respected. We shall make war like generous enemies and aim only at the tyrants who enslave you. The conferences for the suspension of hostilities took place at headquarters at the house of Salmatoris, then Major Dotel to the king, and afterwards... Empress Prefect of the Palace, a tour, the Piedmontese General, and Colonel Lacoste, bearing powers from the king, came to Churrasco. Count Latour, an old soldier who was Lieutenant General in the service of the King of Sardinia, was extremely hostile to all new ideas of little information and a common capacity. Colonel Lacoste, a native of Savoy, a man in the prime of life, expressed himself with facility, possessed much wit and made a favorable impression. The conditions were that the king should abandon the coalition and send a plenipotentiary to Paris to treat for a definitive peace, that in the meantime there should be an armistice, and until the conclusion of peace or the breaking off the negotiations, Savaconi and either Tortone or Alessandria should be forthwith surrendered to the French army with all their artillery and magazines, and the French army should continue to occupy all the ground which was at that moment in its possession, that the military roads in all directions should permit the free communication of the army with France and of France with the army that Valencia should immediately be evacuated by the Neapolitans and placed in the hands of the French general until he should have effected the passage of the Pope. Finally, that the militia of the country should be disbanded and that the regular troops should be dispersed in the fortresses in such a manner as to give no umbrage to the French. Henceforth, the Austrians left to themselves could be pursued into the very heart of Lombardy. All the troops of the army of the Alps and the neighborhood of Lyon were now become disposable and would join the army. Our line of communication with Paris would be shortened by one half. Finally, we now at points of Epri and grand depots of artillery to form our besieging trains and even to besiege Turin if the directory should not conclude peace. Ten aides de camp, Colonel Murat, crosses Piedmont and carries to Paris the news of the successes of the army. Colonel Murat, first aide de camp to the general in chief, was dispatched to Paris with 21 stand of colors and 
the copy of the armistice. Napoleon had taken this officer into his service on the 13th of Vendemire. He was then a major of the 21st Chassers. He afterwards married the Empress' sister, became a marshal of the Empire, High Admiral, Grand Duke of Berg, and King of Naples. He performed a grand part in all the military operations of the time. He always displayed a great courage and particularly a singular hardihood in cavalry movements. The Prince of Province of Alba, which the French crossed, was of all Piedmont, the country most averse to the royal authority and that which contained the greatest proportion of revolutionary germs. Some troubles had already broken forth there, and others subsequently burst out. If instead of negotiating, Napoleon had chosen to continue the war with the king of Sardinia, it is in that country that he would have found the greatest assistance and the greatest disposition to insurrection. Thus, in 15 days, the principal point of the plan of the campaign was secured. The greatest results were obtained. The Piedmontese fortresses of the Alps were in our power. The coalition was deprived of an ally who had an army of 50,000 men and who was still more important on account of a situation. The national legislator had five times decreed that the army had deserved well of the country in the sittings of the 21st, 22nd, 24th, 25th, and the 26th of April, according to the conditions of the armistice of Trasco, the king of Sardinia sent Count Ravel to Paris to treat for the definitive peace. It was concluded and signed on the 15th of May by permanently with the French army, Lusa, La Brunette, and the exiles were demolished. The Alps became open, and the king remained at the disposal of the Republic, having no fortified place but Turin and Fort Bar. No to the editor. We mention here, once for all, that differences will necessarily be found between the official reports and these chapters. They arise from the pre precipitancy with which the reports were drawn up from the wish of the general in chief to disguise his plans, the necessity of deceiving the enemy with respect to his real strength, ATC. For instance, it is said at the report that Beaulieu attacked in person at Montenotti. It was thought so at the time, farther on it is said that the attack on Voltry was made by only 10,000 Austrians, but they had in the rear two columns of the same strength which were to engage on the following day, Beaulieu, having judged that on this point he should have to oppose the whole of the French army. It is also said that Mozzanotti was attacked by only 15,000 men because 10,000 men of this corps remained in their rear and kept up the communication with the right at Seva. It was against these troops that Messina, debouching at break of day by Catabona, fired the first cannon. If there is nothing said respecting the plans of the general in chief or of his negotiations with Genoa. It is because the report published is only an extract from the official correspondence and because moreover, as we have already observed, it was part of the general in chief's plan to keep the enemy ignorant of his projects and his mode of warfare. This may suffice to explain here after any differences that may be observed. We repeat, that the present observation is to be understood as applying once and for all. Fragments of chapter three. One, reasons for remaining on the line of the Ticino, the armistice being concluded, and the fortresses of Coni, Tortona, and Seva surrendered to us. It was inquired whether we ought now to pass the Ticino. It was well understood that the armistice which had just placed these fortresses in our power and separated the Piedmontese army from that of Austria was useful. But it was asked whether it would not now be most advantageous to profit by the means already acquired in order to revolutionize Piedmont and Genoa completely before advancing any farther. The directory had the right rejecting the proposed negotiations and declaring its will by an ultimatum. Would it not be impolitic, it was said, to go still further from France and pass to Ticino? Without securing our rear, the kings of Sardinia, who have been so useful whilst they fought for us, have been the chief contributors to our reverses. As soon as they have changed their policy at this day, the disposition of that monarch leaves not the smallest room for illusion. The nobles and the priests govern his court and are the reconciled enemies of the republic. If we were to experience a defeat in advancing, what should we not have to dread from their hatred and vengeance. Even Genoa ought to be a source of great apprehension to us. Oh, the Gorkical system still reigns there, and however numerous our partisans in that 
Court or maybe. They have no influence in the political decisions. The citizens of Genoa made the claim. Indeed. But that is the extent of their power. The oligarchists rule. They command the troops and can dispose of eight or 10,000 peasants in the valley of Fontana Bona and other places whom they call to their defense in critical emergencies. Finally, it was asked, where were we to stop? Should we pass it to Chino, the Adda, the Oglio, the Mencio, the Adige, the Brenta, the Piaf, and the Tagliamento in order to reach the Isonzo? Was it prudent to leave behind us such numerous and unfriendly populations? Was not the true way to go fast and that of going wisely, making point to support in every country we should pass by changing the government and confiding the affairs of the state to persons of the same opinions and interests as ourselves? If we enter the territories of Venice, should we not oblige that republic, which could command 50,000 men to take part with our enemies, to... Reasons for taking the line of the Adige to the foregoing remarks. It was answered the French army ought to follow up its victory. We ought only to stop on the best line of defense against the armies, which will speedily march to oppose us. That line is the Adige. It covers the valleys of the Po. It intercepts middle and lower Italy. It covers the blockade and siege of Mantua. And probably that place may be taken before the contest can recommence by proceeding to the Adige. We gain the means of providing for all the expenses of the army because the weight of that expense is divided amongst a more numerous population. That of Piedmont, Lombardy, and the locations it is feared that Venice may declare against us. The best way of preventing it is to carry the war in a few days into the midst of her states. She is not prepared for such an event. She has not had time to levy troops and form resolutions. The Senate must be prevented from deliberating. Instead of which, if we remain on the Ticino, the Austrians may force Venice to make common cause with them, or she may herself be induced to do so by the spirit of party. The king of Sardinia is no longer formidable. His militia is disbanded. The English will cease their subsidies. Internal affairs are in the worst possible condition in his dominions. Whatever step the court may take, the number of the disaffected will increase. After fever comes stability. Twelve or 15,000 is the utmost amount of forces which his power can still retain, and these are disseminated throughout a great number of towns. They are scarcely sufficient to maintain internal tranquility. Besides, the hatred of Austria towards the king of Sardinia will keep constantly increasing. She will complain that on the loss of a single battle, she was abandoned by her confederate. She will reproach him with the example of his, of his ancestors who remained faithful allies even when France was mistress of Turin. While, in this instance, he has deserted the joint cause without even the loss of a fortress. The court of Sardinia has therefore henceforth much to fear from the Austrians. There is nothing to be apprehended from the oligarchists of Genoa. Our best security against them is the immense profit they make by their neutrality in propagating the principles of liberty in Piedmont and Genoa. In kindling civil war there, we should be raising the people against the nobles and priests. We should become responsible for the excesses which always attends such a contest. On the contrary, we should, when arrived on the Adige, be masters of all the states of the House of Austria in Italy and of those of the Pope. On this side of the Apennines, we should be in a situation to proclaim the principles of liberty as well as to excite Italian patriotism against foreign domination and the irritation of the people of Bologna and Ferrara against the papal government. There would be no occasion to sow division amongst the various classes of citizens. Nobles, citizens, and peasants would all be equally called upon to march unanimously for the restoration of the Italian nation. The word Italia, Italia, proclaimed from Milan to Bologna, would produce a magical effect. Should it be proclaimed on the Ticino, the Italians would say, why do you not advance? Three, topography of Italy. The great northern plains of Italy comprise between the Alps, which divide them from France, Switzerland, and Germany, the Apennines, which divide them from Genoa and Tuscany, and the Adriatic compose the valley of the Po. The valleys which extend to the Adriatic north 
of the Po and the valleys which extend to the Adriatic south of the Po. These valleys are not subdivided by any hills, so the communications might be open between all the rivers if necessary. They constitute one of the most fertile, grandest, richest plains in the world covered with opulent cities and a population of eight or ten million. This immense plain comprises Piedmont, Lombardy, Parma, Placentia, Modena, Bologna, Ferrara, Romagna, and the Venetian countries. For Valley of the Po, the Po rises in Mount Viso and receives successfully on its left at Turin the Dwar, which descends from Mount Geneva. A little lower at Chivazo, the Duria Baltia, which comes from the great San Bernard. Between Casal and Valenza, the Sassia, at Pavia, the Ticino, which descends from Lake Maggiore. The heights of the Simplon near Bogoforte. The Oglio from the Lake Iseo near Governolo, the Menzio, and the Lake Agarda. The Po receives on its right bank all the streams which rise in the Apennines, the T Naro, below Valenza and Alessandria, to Scrivia, below Tortona and Castle Nuevo, the Trivia above Plasencia, the Taro above Castle Maggiore, the Crosolo, near Gostala, the Seccia, near San Benedetto, the Pinaro and the Reno in the vicinity of Ferrara, and finally falls into the Adriatic 30 miles beyond Ferrara by several miles. This River may also be considered as a kind of sea on account of the great number of streams it receives in all directions. It raised above the soil and banked by dikes so that the finest countries of Italy are like Holland, gained by art from the dominion of the waters. There is little or no cause for solicitude respecting the course of the true Terry rivers. On the left bank, nature there takes its course without causing any convenience. Thus the Dorea, Baltia, the Ticino, and the Adda enter the Po without occasioning any damage. It is otherwise with the tributary streams on the right bank. Below the Tenero, all the rivers are subject to great disorders and give rise to difficult questions. In hydraulics, it is necessary to raise the dikes every year because the countries through which they pass, particularly Parma, Modena, Bologna, and Ferrara, suffer heavy inundations. It is owing to this perpetual recurrence of natural difficulties that the Italians have become so skillful in hydraulic science. The engineers of that country have carried this branch of our knowledge farther than it has pursued in any other. The tributary streams on the opposite side of the Po also differ in this respect, that those of the left bank are almost always navigable and scarcely ever fordable, whilst those in the right bank are never navigable and are almost always fordable. The former are rivers, the latter are only torrents. NB. Here finishes this first part of the chapter. I am the more inclined to regret my not having the whole of it because the remaining part contains a methodical enumeration of all the means of defenses which Italy possesses against Austria. This piece the emperor himself did not hesitate to consider very fine and entitled to become of classical authority to military men as long, said he, as the forms and physical details of the peninsula remained unaltered. It will, however, infallibly found in the complete work of the campaigns of Italy. February the 1st, the happiest and wisest philosophy is that which sometimes enables us to view the least unfavorable side of the most disagreeable things. The emperor, who was doubtless at the moment under the influence of this happy feeling, observed as we were walking with him in the garden that after all, as a place of exile, perhaps St. Helena was the best it could be. In high latitudes, we should have suffered greatly from cold. And in any other island of the tropic, we should have dragged out a miserable existence under the scorching rays of the sun. This rock continued. He is wild and barren, no doubt. The climate is monotonous and unwholesome. But the temperature, must be confessed, is mild and agreeable. He afterwards asked me, in the course of conversation, which would have been preferable, England or America, in case we had been free to follow our own inclinations. I replied... And had the emperor wished to spend his days in philosophic retirement far from the tumult of the world, he should have chosen America. But if he felt any interest or entertained any afterthought with regard to public affairs, he should have preferred England. And not willing to be behind in giving an additional touch to the flattering picture which the emperor had drawn of our miserable rock, I have ventured to say that there might be circumstances under which St. Helena would not be found the worst possible asylum. We might here be under shelter while the tempest was howling in other parts of the world and we were placed beyond the reach 
of conflicting passions, circumstances, every way favorable to the chance of a happier future. These observations arose out of my wish to represent things on their fairest side. I extended the horizon to the utmost stretch of my imagination. Meanwhile, in order to afford a correct idea of our place of exile and the scantiness of its resources, it is only necessary to observe that we were this day informed that it would be requisite to economize various articles of our daily consumption, and perhaps even to make a temporary sacrifice of some. We were told that the store of coffee was rapidly diminishing and that it might soon be entirely exhausted. For a considerable time, we had denied ourselves the use of white sugar, there was but very little, and that very bad, which was reserved exclusively for the emperor's use, and there is now every prospect of this little supply being exhausted before more can be obtained. It is the same with various other necessaries. Our island is like a ship at sea. Our stores are speedily exhausted. If the voyage be prolonged, or if we have more mouths to feed, then we have the means of supply. Our arrival has produced a scarcity at St. Helena, particularly as trading ships are not now suffered to approach the island. We might be tempted to believe that they avoid it as a fatal rock, were we not aware that the English cruiser carefully keeps them at bay. But... Of all the provisions with which we are threatened, that which most surprises us and which is most of all vexation is the want of writing paper. We are informed that during our three months' residence, we have consumed all the paper in the island, which proves either that St. Helena is in general very scantily supplied with that article or that we have used a most unreasonable quantity. The inmates of Longwood must have consumed six or eight times as much as all the rest of the colony together. In addition to this, our physical and moral privations must be taken into account. It must be recollected that we are not in the full enjoyment of even the few resources which the island affords, and of which arbitrary feeling and caprice in part deprive us, for we are not permitted to regale our eyes with the sight of the grass and foliage in places at a certain distance from Longwood, the admiral had promised that the emperor should be free to ride over the whole of the island and that he would make arrangements with respect to his guard so as to free him from all annoyance. It has already been seen how on our second attempt to avail ourselves of it, the admiral broke this kind of engagement, and by his orders, an officer insisted on accompanying the emperor in his rides. The emperor consequently renounced the idea of taking any excursion whatever, and we now remain cut off from all communication with mankind. With respect to our physical existence, our situation is most miserable, either through unavoidable circumstances or mismanagement. Scarcely any of the provisions are eatable. The wine is extricable, the oil unfit for use, the coffee and sugar almost at an end, and as I have already observed, we have nearly bred a famine in the island. Of course, we can endure all these privations and might contrive to exist under many more, but when it is asserted that we are treated in a style of magnificence, when it is declared that we are very well off, we are induced to unfold our real situation and to show that we are destitute of every comfort, and lest our silence hereafter should lead to the inference that we are happy, let it be understood that our moral strength may enable us to endure miseries which language would be inadequate to express. Second, my son, having been for some time past trouble with a pain in his chest, accompanied by violent palpitations of the heart, I called in three surgeons, and they ordered him to be bled. Bleeding is at present the favorite remedy with the English. It is their universal panacea. They employ it in all disorders, and sometimes where there is no disorder at all. They laughed at the astonishment we evinced at a treatment which was altogether new to us. About the middle of the day, we took a ride in the calash on our return turn home. The emperor wished to see a horse that had just been purchased for him. He had thought him very handsome and well-made. He tried and declared that he liked him uncommonly, and that with the most captivating good nature, gave him as a present to me. However, I could not ride him. He proved vicious, and he was transferred to General Gorgout, who is a much better horseman than I am. 
the third through the sixth. The third was a terrible day. The rain fell incessantly. We found it impossible to stir out. The weather was, has continued wet for several days in succession. I never imagined we could have contrived to stay for such a length of time within doors. The damp is penetrating on every side of our dwelling, and the rain is making its way to the roof. The bad weather without doors had an unpleasant effect upon us within. I became very dull. The emperor was by no means well, and I was not better. What is the matter with you, said he to me one morning. You seem quite altered for these few days. Is your mind ailing? Are you conjuring up dragons like Madame de Sevigny? Sire replied, my illness is altogether bodily. The state of my eyes affects me exceedingly. As for my mind, I know not how to keep that under the bridle. I can even use the curb if needful, and your majesty has given me a pair of spurs which will be my last and victorious resource. The emperor devoted three, four, and even five hours at a time to the study of English. His progress was really very remarkable. He felt this, and he is delighted at it. He frequently says that he is indebted to me for this conquest, and that he considers it a very important one. For my part, however, I can claim no other merit than the method which I adopted with regard to the other occupations of the emperor. I first suggested the idea, and they continually reverted to it. And when it was once fairly set on foot, I followed up its execution with the promptitude and daily regularity which stimulated the emperor to proceed. If any of us happened not to be ready at the moment he wanted us, if it was found necessary to postpone any business till the following day, he was immediately seized with disgust, and his labors were suspended until some circumstance occurred to induce him to renew them. I stand in need of excitement, said he, in one of these transient interruptions. Nothing but the pleasure of advancement can bear me through. For between you and me, it must needs be confessed that there is nothing very amusing in all this. Indeed, there is very little diversion in the whole routine of our present existence. The emperor still continued to play two or three games of chess before dinner. In the afternoons, we again resumed reverses, which had long been abandoned. Formerly, we had not been very regular in paying our debts of honor and we henceforth agreed to pay the sums that we owed to each other in a general bank we began to consider how the money thus accumulated should be disposed of the emperor asked her opinions and someone proposed that the money should be applied to the liberation of the prettiest female slave in the island this idea was universally approved we sat down to play with great spirit and the first evening produced two napoleons and a half